Hey everybody, and welcome back to Submarine History. Today we're going to be talking about damage control on U-boats. This is an interesting topic, um, one that doesn't really get addressed uh, except in passing in most books, with a few notable exceptions. Um, so for this briefing, I had to go back to the German technical documents and U.S. Navy design studies uh, of U-boats over at uboatarchive.net. <clears throat> Because we're heavy on uh, internet resources for this briefing, I've included links to the references used for this briefing in the video description below. So there are uh, two books, uh, at least that I'm familiar with, which are notable for their treatment and description of damage control. Uh, one is Grey Wolf, Grey Sea uh, by E.B. Gassaway, and uh, The Bravest Man, Richard O'Kane in the Amazing Submarine Adventures of the USS Tang by William Tuohy. In each of these books, there are great descriptions about submarine crews uh, escaping subs that have sunk from battle damage. It's even better if you can read the books uh, back to back to give you a comparison on how life differed uh, on each nation's submarines and how they conducted operations. As always, uh, feel free to stop the briefing uh, if you want to study a slide and if you have questions, post them in the comments uh, below or hop on the submarine discord and we can discuss discuss it further. Uh, and you'll see uh, an icon for the Discord server in the right lower hand side of the banner for this YouTube channel. Um, and just to let you know, you know, we're going to be going through a series of slides and then towards the end there's going to be an equation that we're going to talk about and I'll explain to you how they did the calculations and stuff. All right, so, uh, so let's go. Our references for today. <laughs> Okay, damage control. So in navies and the uh, maritime industry, damage control is the emergency control of situations that may cause the sinking of a watercraft. And examples of damage are ruptures uh, to pipes or the hull, uh, especially below the waterline, damage from grounding or running aground, or hard berthing against a wharf or temporary fixing of bomb or explosive damage. Now, um, examples of damage control, locking off the damaged area uh, from other ship's compartments, blocking the damaged area by wedging a box around a tear in the ship's hull, or putting a band of thin sheet steel around a tear in a pipe bound on by clamps. There are other examples, obviously. These are just some simple ones. Okay, so uh, damage control training is undertaken by most seafarers, uh, but the engineering staff are the most experienced in making lasting repairs. And damage control is distinct from firefighting. Damage control methods of fighting fire are based on the class of ship and cater to ship specific equipment on board. So that's an important distinction. Now for today, we're gonna to be talking about the Type 7C U-boat and most of the briefing is based on this reference uh, over at uh, uboatarchive.net. And this is a this was a German te technical document called uh, Preliminary U-Boat Information U-Boat Type 7C. And over at uboatarchive.net, they had actually translated this into English. But it's kind of like an owner's manual for the Type 7. Okay, so to increase the safety of the boat, haul electrical and machinery damage control parties are formed and these parties have the following tasks removing leaks due to enemy action removing damage to machinery and electrical installations due to enemy action passing orders through the boat and reducing noise during approach and evasion and improving depth keeping which is especially demanding in the presence of the enemy and uh, from this preliminary uh, document there was a table in there and it actually explains uh, how they organized the uh, damage control parties and where they were and then like the, um, the technical background of, of the members of each damage control team. So for an ex example, um, we'll go with the first line here, hull party one, uh, they would be posted in the e-motor room and there would be one petty officer in career track two, which is machinist. And then there would be two additional members of that uh, damage control party. Uh, one, 
Uh, these, these, these would have been enlisted, not petty officers. So you have a petty officer and then you have some junior enlisted. Um, and the uh, enlisted would be a machinist and a mechanic. So your, your machinists you draw from the engine room, the mechanics you draw from the uh, torpedo men. So in addition to the damage control parties themselves, they had damage control kits. And in the case of the Type 7, they would have had three of these kits staged throughout the boat. Um, in our case here, we have one in the forward torpedo room, one in the control room, and one in the aft torpedo room and e-motor room. And, um, you know, kind of like the basic tools of the trade that you would need to um, control damage. I won't read this. You can always just pause this if you want to read through the equipment, uh, through, excuse me, through the tool list. But in addition to the damage control kits, they would have also have uh, stored timber and board uh, boards so that uh, if there was, so if they had to do something like support a bulkhead or seal a hole in the pressure hull, they would have the materials on hand that they could just like, you know, set it in place and secure it and then um, try to continue operations or, or get out of dodge. So in addition to the damage control parties, the damage control kits and the uh, boards and timber, there would have, they would have had shop equipment on board consisting of a, le of a lathe, a drill press, arc and acetylene welding outfits. Uh, which would have been used for routine and emergency repair work. Now the arc and acetylene torch equipment uh, was likely used for repair work when surfaced due to the risk of hydrogen, hydrogen gas inside the boat when submerged uh, from combat damage to batteries. And we talked about this in the previous briefing. You can look it up if you want. I'll probably put something in the description so that you can go to that, uh, go to that briefing and learn more about hydrogen gas and uh, batteries on uh, submarines. Okay, so leaks and flooding. So surfaced, uh, leaks into external tanks are not dangerous for the boat. Uh, the reserve buoyancy provides enough displacement to keep the boat on the surface. Uh, small leaks in the pressure hull can be removed by uh, means of the main drain pump, which was located like in the bilge area in the control, in the control room. So submerged. Uh, so when we're submerged, we have two trim conditions. There's trim condition A, and that's where your main ballast tanks and main ballast tank and reserve fuel oil tanks are empty and you're carrying a standard load on the boat. And uh, what this tells us is that you have, if I'm, if I'm interpreting the document correctly, this is telling us that we have 155 cubic meters of reserve buoyancy on the submarine. Trim condition B uh, is when the main ballast tanks and the main ballast tank and reserve fuel oil tanks are filled with fuel oil and we have, an, we have an increased load on the boat, our combat load. And in that case, again, if I am understanding the document correctly, uh, we have a reserve buoyancy of 105 meters cubed. The reserve of compressed air on the Type 7 CU boat is sufficient for a one-time blow-off of all main ballast tanks and the main ballast and reserve fuel oil tanks, that 155 meters cubed. And they could blow that entire volume at a depth of 40 meters. The main ballast tanks only, uh, which is 105 meter cubes, we can blow that volume at a depth of 65 meters. And at a depth of 100 meters, only 71 uh, meters cubed can be blown. And the volume of air that we can blow is going down as we get deeper simply because of the increased pressure uh, from water at deeper depths. So in that, uh, in that preliminary uh, information document on the Type 7C, they actually have a, for the convenience, likely for the boat's engineer, they have this table. And this table would be able to give the engineer some quick information about whether or not they could effectively pump out water coming in from certain size holes at certain depths. And uh, we'll look at, um, we'll look at the first line. So on the left, it tells us what, it tells you what depth, that, if you're at this depth, then that second column, uh, it tells you whether the main drain pump or what the operating mode of that drain, uh, excuse me, of that main drain pump is. 
whether that pump is operating in parallel or series. Because besides the main drain pump, there is an auxiliary trim and drain pump that can be connected to the main drain pump to either operate in parallel so, they get, so that they can remove larger volumes of water or they can be connected in series to pump out the same volume of water but at a deeper depth. And as we read across this table to the right, what we see is that if your, if your hole is in the control room for that first line, we're one meter deep, if the hole is in the main control room at a depth of one meter, you can effectively pump water out from a leak that's 57 centimeters square in size. And then as we get deeper, we'll go down to, well, we'll go down to the 100, 100 meter depth mark here. So at a depth of 100 meters, if the, if the hole in the pressure hull is in the control room, you can pump out, you can effectively pump out water for only a two centimeter square hole. And in order to do that, you have to run the main drain pump and the auxiliary trim and drain pump in series to give you the pressure boost that you need. Now, if you look at the uh, columns, there's one that um, gives you information if the hole, if the penetration or hole is towards the after of the ship, and then the far right column uh, will tell you your your effective pumping if the hole is towards the bow of the ship. And these are so looking at the first line again, you'll notice that um, as I said before, in the control room, if you've got a 57 centimeter hole, you can effectively pump that out. But at that same depth, if the hole is towards the stern of the ship, you can only pu effectively pump out water if the hole is 31 centimeters squared. And if it's towards the bow of the ship, you can only uh, effectively pump water out if it's a 24 uh, centimeter square hole. And the reason for that is, with the drain pump being located in the middle of the boat, um, there there's head losses in the uh, in the uh, in the pump suction piping, carrying water from the from the stern of the boat or carrying water from the bow of the boat to the control room, where then it's then it's pumped out. So, so the question that probably comes up is, well, how did how did they know that they could have, that they could effectively pump out water? at a certain depth with a certain size hole. How, how do they figure that out? And we're going we're gonna to look at that. So there's something called Torricelli's Law, uh, also known as Torricelli's Theorem. Uh, and it is a theorem in fluid dynamics relating the speed of fluid flowing from an orifice to the height of fluid above that opening. So just think about that. And I think that the, vidu the visual really helps a lot. So if we have a cylinder and um, we have uh, holes drilled in the side of that cylinder all the way down, the, the hole at the bottom of that cylinder is going to be the strongest jet and that's because of the, uh, that's gonna, it's going to be because of the pressure of the water at that depth. So we can rearrange that equation. Um, we can substitute uh, flow and area for velocity and then also include a coefficient and that will and that will that's what they used actually to set up that uh, that table so that the engineer doesn't have to sit there and with a slide rule because that's what they would have had back then uh, he doesn't have to do a calculation to see whether or not a particular size hole can be pumped out at the depth that they're at that would take too much time so for the convenience of the of the ships uh, excuse me of the boats engineer they basically, the designers take this equation, they put in the numbers at the various steps and they generated that table so that the uh, engineer could look at that, quickly look at that table. He could say this hole is, a, is X centimeter square in size. And this table tells me I have to be maybe at 40 meters in order to be able to effectively pump water out instead of that the 100 meters that we're currently at. So he would have to take that into account and try to get the boat up to uh, 
the right depth so that they could actually uh, get those pumps to work. So as soon as it becomes clear uh, that the boat is not able to surface uh, immediately without waiting for any help, the crew prepares for escape. Pressure equalization takes place by intentional flooding of the pressurized compartment of the entire boat, followed by the rapid exit of the crew. So this is very different from the way the United States did it. The United States, if you take, for example, uh, the Gatto class submarine, in that submarine, they actually have, um, they have they actually have an escape chamber. So it's a small pressurized chamber uh, with a watertight door that from the interior of the boat, you could move into the smaller uh, escape chamber, seal it, and then you could flood the escape chamber itself. And then once that pressure was equalized, there was a hatch on top that could be opened and then the sailors could exit the boat. And the benefit of that was that it allowed the interior of the boat to remain dry uh, and to maintain the available air in that space. And, um, you know, they were able to do that because those Gattos were, you know, a, a Gatto class submarine is probably, from a displacement standpoint, it's like twice the size of a Type 7C. So in a bigger boat, you could afford to dedicate some of that space to uh, something like an escape chamber, something with a specific purpose. Where with on the Type 7C, I'm guessing just because the size of the boat, it wasn't practical for them to put in a, an escape chamber. So they just decided, hey, your whole boat is going to be your escape chamber. And, uh, you know, that, that works. Um, the only risk there is that um, everybody has to be ready to go because you got one shot at getting out. So, in general, uh, escape from a submarine without breathing assistance, um, example, like a, like a breathing escape set, is limited to depths uh, to less than 125 feet. But, however, uh, having said that, es successful escapes uh, without, I can't say if that's w without a breathing a breathing set. But I do know from reading literature and survey of literature that su successful escapes from submarines were recorded from 180 feet. And uh, I had seen mentions of depths as, as deep as 250 feet, but I wasn't able to verify that. And during the war, you know, there were a number of boats that uh, they sank to the bottom of the ocean and they were at a depth and the boat was in a position where an escape was favorable. And some of the notable cases were uh, the U-64, uh, HMS Perseus, and USS Tang. So on U-boats, they had something called the uh, Drager Escape Set. Uh, in the German, I believe, if I pronounce this right, this is Tausch Retter, which is equivalent to Diving Rescuer. But it's a rebreathing device that used soda lime uh, to remove the carbon dioxide. And one was issued to each sailor on the U-boat, plus they had extra sets in reserve. And they might have like uh, 10 to 20 extra sets in reserve. And you would use those first if you were, if you were in an environment uh, underwater where you needed to do damage control. And the, uh, and the, uh, and the air conditions were not favorable to uh, regular breathing. So... And these Drager uh, escape sets, uh, they could sustain breathing for 15 to 45 minutes, you know, depending on pressure and the level of a sailor's exertion. And that's it for today, everyone. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the briefing and we'll come back again. Feel free to contact me via email. I am on Discord, Twitter, and I do have a Patreon. Thanks to USNI for doing the job they do so well. Their publishing arm is an invaluable resource to the preservation of naval history. Consider becoming a member so their work can continue long into the future. Till next time, peace out.